Good morning or afternoon, wherever you may be. My name is Rick Bartlett. I work with Unisor Solutions, and it's my pleasure to help facilitate this discussion today. Thank you all for joining us. We've assembled a panel of experts with a cross-section of industry focus, experience, and expertise, and we're looking forward to hearing each of their thoughts on work, workplace strategy as we move through this season and beyond the current pandemic. Now to help us get started, I'd like to introduce our CEO, Jim Kastner. Thank you very much, Rick, and good morning, everybody. I am very grateful for everybody taking the time to uh, participate, you know, really kind of as we're, as we continue to move through some really, really uncharted territories and business leaders are, are really trying to, to, to navigate their response to, to this crisis that I'm, that I'm sure will, uh, will affect how we work and collaborate and, social, and socialize for uh, a long time to come. And to that extent, you know, Unisource Solutions, I wanna make every, let everyone know, is absolutely committed to connect with the market and share relevant and impact uh, information as it relates to workplace knowledge. Uh, today, this seasoned team of professionals that we're bringing together has the, has the knowledge, the strategic ver, uh, vision, and really the tactical skill sets uh, required to help navigate the roadmap back to the office, and more importantly, develop, I think, the foundation for a long-term strategy, workplace strategy. I firmly believe that collaboration with the right partners is key to navigating a, a successful return to what I'm calling, what everybody is calling the new normal. We have a very successful history working with this team before you today. You know, it's said that necessity is the, uh, the mother of invention. And that, is, that is becoming very evident by some of the questions that our customers are asking us today about, you know, how they align their workplace strategy with employee safety, unknown occupancy levels, evolving employee activities, you know, workplace service delivery models, and performance management. So I guess my promise to everybody today is that, you know, between Rick and our panel, uh, we are going to bring, bring to you and deliver to you some real good take home value. For uh, those of you that don't know us, uh, a little bit of background on us, Unisor Solutions has been providing workplace products and services since 1987. Uh, we're passionate about creating, outfitting, managing, and measuring workplaces that really engage and inspire the people that occupy them. We have a unique perspective with our combination of design products and service solutions uh, it really give us an intimate understanding of the connection between developing solid workplace strategy and the tactical implementation. You know, we, we, we believe in helping our customers do great things and our customer relationships are typically very, very long and consultative. consultative. And we have, we're, you know, we're managing and helping some of the largest corporations throughout the country uh, today. But we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in being a resource for knowledge like we're doing today. Uh, we truly believe that workplace analytics is a strategic tool to positively impact uh, agility, uh, activity-based design, health and wellness, and cost management. And lastly, we believe in an end-to-end -end solution that consistently delivers projects and programs on time, on budget, with little or no oversight. You know, building with this team, really building confidence. So let's talk briefly kind of about, uh, kind of what we know about the, the state of the workplace today, kind of what's going on. You know, what we know today is we need to get ready for kind of a permanent hybrid way of working. I mean, everyone knows now remote working is here to stay after one of the largest case studies in the history of our country. Social distancing is gonna be here for a long time on a lot of different levels. Uh, you know, we're, we're gonna be seeing occupancy levels have a big shift. Compliance with new standards are going to require a whole new set of protocols. How we communicate to the workplace is going to be very important. We need to be able to communicate with confidence. We're gonna see more robotics in the office of the future. 
uh, change management and changing behaviors, nudging behaviors is going to play an incredibly important role. And the whole idea of the six foot office is a prototype. This is not a final solution that people are, are talking about today. This is going to be tested with data and surveys and it's gonna to evolve to really create a, a meaningful experience in the office. And you know, really what I think we're, what we're talking about today is these are new problems and these new problems are we're gonna require new solutions. In, and right, right now is absolutely now is the time to develop your plan to establish a return to work program and return to work milestones. So that's kind of where we sit today as I see from my perspective with where the workplace is. And the objectives of this meeting today that the team will give you, Wendy, next slide, is really help you to prepare, prepare for the workplace, prepare the work uh, the workplace, prepare the workforce, you know, how you're going to return, you know, how you're going to deal with the anxiety coming back to the office, and really lay the framework for developing a long-term workplace strategy that includes every single aspect of the workplace. So with that, Rick, I'd like to turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Jim. So our discussion today will be broken into two parts with our panelists first sharing their perspectives individually. And then in the second part, they'll answer questions directly from the audience. So we uh, please feel free to, to use the chat function to ask a, a question and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, and before we get started, I would just like to take a couple minutes to introduce each of our guests. Tani Kosloff is the design and innovation lead at Huddle HQ. With more than 20 years of interior design and workplace programming expertise, Tani most recently oversaw the total redesign and organizational change management process for a, a major global biotech company. She holds a bachelor's in design from Cal State Northridge and a master's in management and organizational behavior from Cal Lutheran. Ala Sobierski is the creative solutions lead at Huddle HQ. A thought leader trained as an architect at Gdansk University in, of Technology in Poland, she's helped major organizations redefine their workplace dynamics globally, regionally, and locally. And like Tammy, she helped engineer and deliver a, a next-gen workplace program that completely repositioned the workspace, laboratory, and manufacturing environments for this same global biotech company. Elizabeth Redman is co-founder and CEO of Coworker, a workplace sensors company. With a background in design, uh, life cycle, uh, anal analysis, and, and materials consulting, she's built a company that helps other companies figure out how to make the most efficient use of their space while maintaining a dynamic and healthy workplace. And then last but not least, Christy Polson is an architect with 17 years of experience. Her projects range from educational, residential, and workplace to museums and sports facilities. She originally joined Vanish Architect in, in 2007 and recently rejoined the firm to lead their Los Angeles office. Christy has many notable achievements throughout her career. Uh, recently leading the design of a new home for the Space Shuttle Endeavor at the California Science Center and helping rehabilitate a massive historic heavy timber hangar in Playa Vista, California by designing 500,000 square feet of workspace within that hangar for Google, a project also known as Google Spruce Goose. Chrissy earned her bachelor's degree from University of Washington and her master's in architecture from the University of British Columbia. She's lectured internationally and has served as an architecture critic for UCLA, USC, and UC Berkeley. So with that, we've got a lot of ground to cover. And as I mentioned, uh, each of the, the panelists are gonna share their perspectives. And we'd just like to start off with a uh, question for, for Tammy and Ola. Uh, before the pandemic, you guys were helping organizations, large and small, develop their next generation workplace strategies with settings that often fostered in-person collaboration and activity-based work, often with more shared spaces 
in favor of individual spaces. How have these space optimization strategies been affected by the crisis already, guys? And how do you see them moving forward in the near term and the longer term? Yeah, great. Thanks, Rick. Um, we're going to talk about how the companies reacted in the face of this pandemic and some of the change management lessons that can be leveraged moving forward. So we believe it's a good practice to take a step back and evaluate what happened before moving forward. Um, thinking back to March, many companies were shutting down and telling their staff to work from home with little to no change management program in place. How could we have? Um, there are a lot of uh, questions with very little answers to why and for how long we are going to be expected to be working from home and how do we work from home? Uh, initially, we were asking ourselves, you know, what just really happened? And, and so it's so good to reflect on what did happen. In the reality, we are really living the largest remote work from home pilot in history. Um, the conditions are far from ideal. I mean, some of us are competing for quiet space in our own home to avoid interruptions during conference calls and staring at a list of endless chores of cooking and deciding when you're gonna run and go get your next groceries. Uh, in the face of the to transition to remote work, organizations really had to embrace a mobile way of working. Um, much thanks to our IT teams and the technology tools came, they all came to the rescue as quickly as possible. Everyone had to grasp the use of technology that they may not have never been familiar with and get comfortable with being on camera, like for instance. Um, how many Zoom calls have you had in the past six weeks? I can't even remember how many I've had now. Many companies have already embraced distributed structures and some with a degree of agile working, which gave them a really um, considerable head start. Other organizations who work in a more traditional manner, primarily from the office, may have experienced a delay in this shift to remote work. So regardless, um, this is the time to really start documenting these efforts. As we move back, we wanna document the struggles and the successes and turn them into change management practices for the future. It's a great opportunity. We suggest you recognize the challenges and evaluate what worked and what didn't work during this expedited and massive test of remote work. Um, we highly recommend that you take time to revisit or put in place organizational change management processes to evolve your workplace programs. Listen to your staff. They are your best resource and document the key points that they've experienced. Ask them how they adapted. Um, talk to them about their newfound expectations and identify the new norms worthy of building on for the future. We believe that by de developing the best practices uh, for the future, companies will be better prepared to leverage opportunities for enhancing their workplace strategies and realizing real estate benefits. So on the next um, point, we'd like to talk about returning to the office. And how do employers and staff move back into the new post COVID-19 par paradigm? There's some solutions, some short term and some long term. We have to ease into this as a transition. While moving from you know, shock to realization to now a response, many organizations are trying to assess who needs to be brought back to work initially. Not all of us have to or can go back um, once these restrictions have been limp, li uh, lifted. With that, there's a lot of new and re-entry protocols with some very specific, uh, and they will be very unique to each organization. So there's not a one size fits all here. A highly likely health and safety will be at the forefront. And we also have to look at the economics and the productivity aspects of it as well. Um, under consideration, there will also be protocols to address occupancy, circulation, um, elevator and stair use, and restroom services. You can expect a zealous introduction of new cleaning processes. Um, the frequency is going to be high. The janitorial services may be happening throughout the day, so you can see what's being cleaned and what's not. 
Also, visual signals such as signage to remind individual responsibility about washing hands, touching your face, keeping your social distance. So, Ala, let's talk more about the workplace strategy. Thanks, Tammy. Um, yes, now we can mention a few short-term solutions to ease the transition back to the physical office. Obviously, workplace planners will and can make social distancing floor plan adjustments and with some examples that are obvious to many of us, like establishing new office capacity and occupancy restrictions, staggering seats to avoid face-to-face -face, face -face placement. Uh, you can temporarily remove some workstations, chairs in the open office environment or in the enclosed meeting spaces. Uh, for activity-based workplace environments, you can lessen the ratio of staff per seat. Um, and uh, also thinking about some not traditional sort of points of view, such as considering clean desk policy for all, not just the activity-based workplace, but all to better address clutter and allow for more effective cleaning practices. We also think about a potential of introduction of um, broader spectrum of amenities. Um, so in addition to obvious difficulties for food services, operations of which will initially be quite limited and will require a long-term approach similar to restaurants industry, most likely pantries, break rooms, coffee areas, the most social areas of our office will have adjusted offerings as well. But it's also an opportunity to create uh, some space to accommodate respite to support uh, all of us that now are stressed and that stress and vulnerability of us humans is not going away anytime soon. That creates an uh, opportunity to, that is new to many organizations to create wellness rooms, to recharge quiet rooms for prayer practice or meditation, um, more of the individual phone booths and isolation spaces, and investment of, um, out, into outdoor areas with abundance of fresh air there that we can escape and sort of recharge. In summary, organizations can uh, start more holistic approach towards better, more productive workday. And, uh, you know, we should all look forward to that to learn, hopefully from this terrible experiment that we are all part of, that the outcomes are going to be quite positive. We can transition now to the next slide and start thinking about corporate real estate impacts that are more long term. For most of companies, as we know, um, most expensive costs are people followed by the cost of the real estate. And now, um, daunting point, if we all have just proven to be able to work from home, it raises a valid question about the expensive workplaces, which now stand locked and silent. Why not take this opportunity to evaluate what actions to take with your space that was already underutilized to begin with? We know about 40% you know, of less utilization on average. This would mean seriously looking at the workplace analytics technology to get facts on how space is being used. And it is really, we see it as a positive side of diving deeper into um, understanding of our space use. It's an opportunity for organizations and workplace strategists to think forward to some transformational prospects, to reimagine workplace, to create a work and workplace that is agile, adaptable, flexible, distributed, always on, resilient, all those attributes that are testing well, you know, today and, and in those passing months. You can test new work practice and tools and allow potentially for some unorthodox solutions that just fit your teams better. You can reassess investment in your teams and talent. So you can, and we all can arise from this deep crisis with both healthier employees and better performing organizations. Eventually science will help us go back to direct interactions. We all, I think, believe in that. We are now embracing the concept of social distancing to prevent the spread of COVID-19. But office is not going away. We are social creatures. We thrive on being together. The new shape of office has opportunity to be better post COVID. 
There is a chance we could use this present stress and crisis to move the entire average up and create new normal, changing the lens of what's better or best, not just good enough. One of the most powerful lessons I think we have already witnessed from the safer at home order has been the strength of human connection. The community at large has found resourceful ways of showing up uh, to their fellow humans. And strong culture and innovation lie at the heart of the best. And post-virus winners will most likely be the organizations which recognize this and have the courage to let go of their old paradigms and start afresh. And with that, I will transfer uh, the virtual mic to Elizabeth that will teach us how better use the potential of technology and, and sensors in our workplace. Great. Thanks, guys. It's, um, it's, it's an interesting point to remember that there's opportunity uh, for progress with uh, even in the adverse situation that we face right now. Uh, Elizabeth, we have a question for you. Uh, your firm has, has been employing sensor technology to analyze usage of space and formulate data-driven strategies that, that primarily maximize efficiency and cost-effectiveness. And now with an increased focus on employee and workplace safety, how do you expect these data-driven strategies to continue shaping the workplace? Yeah, good questions. And questions that we've definitely been addressing for the last six weeks while we've been social distancing and in quarantine. Um, and Wendy, you can throw those slides up there if you'd like. Uh, so I, I first want to kind of start with talking about the open office. Um, this is a common stat we actually took from Gensler, a recent article in the Chicago Tribune that 70% of American offices use some form of the open plan. And that may me seem kind of scary to people. You look at, um, you look at that open plan and you say, geez, those seats look really close together. It's all packed in there pretty tightly. But the fact of the matter is, which I've been speaking with about in with some folks and in some conversations is that the open plan is actually a bit safer and by nature much cleaner than your traditional office layout. Um, if you think of a traditional assigned workplace um, where you have workstations that people return to on a daily basis, they tend to be a bit more dirty. I mean, we, we leave our things behind. We tend to eat at these workstations more often. Um, and though like that seems like our, our safe space, um, it tends to actually be much less sanitary. So sanitation, airflow are two key topics that we're thinking about both in sensor application and just uh, the health of the workplace in the future in general. And so we're looking at this positively in um, all the organizations that have transitioned to the open workplace um, and are considering this as part of their transition. Um, another fact that folks are facing is um, not necessarily being able to increase their portfolio right now, but needing to go down to probably 50% occupancy for the foreseeable future, which means is forcing a lot of them into an ABW um, concept. Um, we can go ahead to the next slide. So we are, as a business coworker, our company deploys tiny work point sensors. They look like this. Um, they're just little sensors <laughs> that are <laughs> fading into the background uh, that go on workstations, on ceilings to measure space. It's very simple data. It's simple binary data, but can be extremely powerful if you think of it kind of at the, the bottom of a upside down pyramid. It's feeding a lot of different systems. So some of the problems that we're looking to solve and have been asked to solve for our customers and future customers are really around connecting the workplace. So once you connect that and bring it online, you have the op opportunity to um, inform things like your daily utilization, your daily cleaning services. So if you have information on exactly what was used that day, you don't necessarily have to clean the entire office equally. And in, in light of, you know, increased sanitization and um, just the increase of cost, which are 
is a huge uh, factor in, in that conversation. This could be a powerful cost savings tool um, or at least cost balancing tool for that. Um, another subject is looking at ventilation and airflow. Obviously, there's a lot of conversation around more um, green services. Um, I don't know the technologies quite as much. I'm sure Christy can speak to those a bit more. Uh, but controlling ventilation energy on those floors based on demand. So where are there people who can increase ventilation or just turning down the, the power to current floors that are not in use. Uh, the other two major factors are um, helping workers find a clean place to work when they get into the office. So considering the open office floor plan where people don't necessarily have assigned desks, there's definitely a lot of emotional insecurity around once I get to the office, how do I find something that I know has been cleaned the day before and someone who could have been impacted by COVID has not sat at that desk earlier in the day. So with simple utilization data from any form of sensor really, um, you may be able to pinpoint exactly which locations have been used that day. And our particular technology, we're focused down to the seat level, but you can apply that up to a room level. So you're just simply monitoring conference rooms and um, seeing if those rooms have been used. Uh, and then the last piece is managing your daily utilization. So getting back to this concept of going down to 50% occupancy, which a lot of our customers, a lot of our partners, customers, seems to be a pretty common trend and kind of implementing it, team A, team B. Um, there's, you know, very easy way to see how many people are showing, showing up to the office every day when you have those sensors in place. Um, and then, you know, as we trend this data over time, we can use that for predictive analytics of hey, what are people comfortable with? What are people using? What do we need to introduce more of? And that gets back into the strategy pieces that Ala and T Tammy contribute to. Um, and using the, the existing data to predict what that workplace is going to need in the future and really future-proof your spaces in a data-driven approach that's not, you know, hearsay and shooting blinds. Um, if you wanna go into the next slide, I can talk about some of the features of what this would look like. So some of the um, ways you can visualize this data is essentially looking at it on your floor plan view. So something that could be passed off to a janitorial service of what exactly has been used and not been used and then in this clean vision approach, that's, that's kind of a concept of where you can present that data to the workers themselves. So they walk in, see a kiosk, be able to pick a desk that's been used not at all or very little over the course of that day. Um, I think there are some, definitely some interesting conversations around how the strategy is changing of using this this typical utilization data that's been a part of our our strategies and processes for the last few years um, and maybe decades for some organizations um, and those trends are definitely changing i think we're going to be using data on a daily basis as opposed to more of a monthly and quarterly basis uh, really using it to bring those spaces online and inform a number of um, a number of systems and it's really on us as technology vendors to kind of step up to the plate and collaborate with our, our other partners in the industry. We know we do work with um, some workplace app technologies. And so I know they're doing a lot to put out communications to their staff through their apps. And those are other, those are the experience oriented components that people are already used to using on a daily basis. And so bringing this whole ecosystem together, feeding the data into that app, feeding it into other sources is really what's going to kind of carry us through and bring us into the future. Um, I'll t leave it up to you, Rick, and we can move on. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's great insight. It's interesting to see how um, sensor technology is kind of going from a, 
a tool that's used for background uh, analytics to to more top of mind uh, a more top of mind communication tool uh, for employee engagement. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Christy, transitioning to you, we have kind of the the, the burning question. I think uh, you know we've seen it a lot. The the question that's been bantered about. Um, in in various uh platforms is is what do you see as the role of workplace moving forward from a general standpoint and and more specifically how will you as an architect balance the 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 financial and functional and organizational objectives of your clients with the physical and emotional and cognitive needs of the people they employ that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think uh, it's, it's, it's multi-layered and um, I think the workplace itself, uh, we haven't lost the essence of the workplace is still being a place of purpose, a place where we come together to create and innovate, share ideas. Uh, it's a great social space for us in our uh, societies. Uh, that is, um, you know, that's something that's not going to change as we move forward, but how we have to adapt those spaces and how we adapt and adjust through that, I think is going to be um, uh, the, the short term change and also some long term changes too. Um, you also brought up the emotional aspects of it too. There's, you know, a lot of discussion on how we um, how the physical workspace is going to look. So, uh, you know, we'll have distancing, of course. Yes, maybe there's a little bit lower density or people come in phased where, um, you know, certain employees are here for certain times of the week and others are at a, a different time. But then there's also the, the kind of trepidation and fear that a lot of people have coming back into the workplace. And so it's very important for the leaders of companies and uh, um, their spaces to have a strategy for their employees and to um, uh, understand that uh, there needs to, you know, not only do we need to look at our workspace through the lens of cleanliness and sanit uh, you know, having this sanitization, but we also need to look at it through both empathy and support for our employees too, so that they feel comfortable when they return. And I think, um, you know, for example, uh, I, I think at this point in, um, when we look at the workspace, you know, we've always talked about healthy work environments, but and well being, but that is going to be seen completely differently and, and with much more emphasis on what is a, a healthy work and safe, healthy and safe work environment and um, and attention to wellness and uh, employees is going to uh, have a, a very different feel to that. And what happens with that, you know, we talk about the quantitative stuff, which is great. All the, the data stuff is going to be extremely helpful to um, inform us on how uh, we need to make changes within the workplace. But it's also reinforcing a, a bigger picture thing, which is the qualitative aspects of our, our workspace environments. So, um, and what I mean by that is, you know, as architects, we've, we, uh, and, and uh, certainly with our office, we're always paying a great level of attention to the qualitative aspects of architecture, meaning bringing uh, fresh air into the building, uh, a natural ventilation, access to outdoor spaces, you know, these are the kinds of things that um, we want to, you know, always bring to our projects, but they're going to be something that as we think about things like real estate and office space, if those qualitative things are not within some of those real, you know, spaces that are being rented out, then they're going to be seen as less um, desirable on a very different level now than they ever were before. Um, we're going to want to make high quality environments for, for workspaces. And I think a big challenge, and it was brought up a little bit before, but a big challenge for many of work environments, you know, are things like mechanical systems and are people going to feel comfortable in hermetically sealed buildings and what is the process of making sure filters are, are um, uh, changed and uh, we are getting fresh air and we are getting air changes and all of our rooms are actually um, uh, well ventilated. You know, those are, I think, some major challenges for a lot of different environments uh, for, um, for workspace. Um, I can tell you from our perspective, uh, what's interesting, uh, we have four offices, two in the US and two in Germany. Our German offices in Stuttgart and Munich will be going back to work before us here in the US, our Boston and LA office. And they've already started to implement a strategy, which is quite interesting. Uh, uh, it's, you know, everyone's not coming back at once. <laughs> it's gonna be a slow process and it's gonna prioritize people who need to be in the office, need to have the, um, uh, uh, be in the same space or have meetings together. Um, 
But in addition, there's like the, the uh, more tactile things, like we're providing face masks for everyone uh, within our uh, communal areas of our workspace. Uh, you know, we have rules about how many people can be in a kitchen. You know, instead of congregating in the mass, it's going to be two people instead of 10 people. Um, we've also asked uh, to uh, make sure meetings um, with outside uh, folks happen outside the office. We're not bringing in people except for employees into the office. And uh, the our offices tend to have the great fortune too that we have outdoor space so um, you know we're going to be moving a lot of meetings outside and one of the things about the timing of coming back to work is at least we're moving into the spring and summer <laughs> months which will um, uh, facilitate more maybe outdoor meetings which I think um, would be fantastic but the, those kinds of things uh, I think I want to you know sort of stress upon the workplace environment that um, you know the importance of um, you know first adapting our spaces but as we look to the future of how we're looking at the uh, work environments is the importance of the qualitative components that we put into the workspace area and uh, you know it, it's it's um, you know, we often talked about health and well-being of yes you want fresh air and yes you want natural daylight well of course we do but not every you know we still have so much infrastructure within our cities that don't do that and don't provide that for a lot of our um, our, our workers so I think that's going to have a much finer point to it uh, uh, when we look to the future. And I think that's going to affect the market and affect, um, uh, again, like what, what spaces in uh, uh, the real estate world will be more desirable versus uh, ones that, uh, you know, are not bringing that health and, and safety uh, to the, the office space. That's great, Christy. Thank you for your insights. We've got about 20 minutes, so we've got lots of questions and, and we'll get right to them. Um, here's one for, for, for all of the panelists right now. Um, do you see work from home burnout as a contrary trend that will send us actually back to the office? Well, I, I'll just jump in on that one. <laughs> Because uh, I think we've all felt that a little bit. I, I, you know, it's funny because I had a conversation yesterday with a client and they said, oh, looking at these images of our new office, they're like, I'm really missing the office. <laughs> And it's, and I think that's a great point. I mean, not only is there burnout, but I think, um, you know, we all have different situations uh, uh, at home. And I think uh, I can speak as from a parent's perspective that uh, as parents, so there's a reason we have a separation between home and work. It's, it's very, um, you know, all of a sudden we're, we are positioned to merge the two together and try to be the best uh, worker you can be, but also be the best teacher and assistant teacher <laughs> to your kids and find that time. And it's a real struggle. And I think that's caused a lot of um, stress. And uh, I think um, that while it, it, there's positives that come out of that as well, I think we're talking about that um, balance uh, and the struggle with that balance from um, uh, the workspace a little bit more and with and it's met with a much more um, sensitivity and empathy. Uh, but I think it reinforces the fact that you know, the workplace is not gone. I mean, uh, yes, that we have to make adjustments and changes, but it's, it's not something that um, is gonna go away. Absolutely, and if I can build on that, uh, Christy, it's, we are all, you know, tired of being isolated, no matter how much we love our cages or homes, right? But at the same time, we also have built new routines and we might have new expectations of the workplace. So just like we have learned to balance the daily, uh, you know, life and, and, and competing priorities throughout the day, we also realized and have learned so much about how we are most effective and what helps us to be most productive and, and kind of, you know, with the, with the best of the outcomes to our work. So it's, it's again, uh, yes, the burnout is here, and, but we also build new set of skills in a way that will help us to be better, I think, on the long run. Yeah, and I think we have a, we have a big opportunity to kind of take a look at productivity as a larger subject um, in light of what we're currently experiencing. And, you know, we're, I hear from a lot of people who are enjoying working from home and realizing how burnout they actually were previously. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it's, it's a big opportunity to reconsider where we can most effectively do the task at hand today. And maybe that's from home, maybe that's in the office, our time in the office may be more intentional in the future. 
and that's that's kind of you know an exciting um opportunity at hand for me in considering our our strategy I'm sure people are going to return to the office and those there's going to be a way of going back in but um you know we may find better balance in the future definitely Tammy, would you like to weigh in on this as I well? Or I've got, I've got another I've got another question for yeah, you if, no, if you know. Fine. And ahead. this is kind of this is kind of geared, <clears throat> I think, toward toward you and Allah. Uh, how would you align a customer's agility requirements and cost objectives with real estate realities? Hmm. Allah, do you want to take? Well, sure. You know, again, this is uh, this is opportunity to rethink your uh, investment in the real estate and uh, perhaps be a bit of a bit of wiser. More is not always better. Uh, you know, our human direct interactions, even though we love them, uh, are becoming a, a bit of the luxury today. And maybe it's gonna this trend might stick because we have proven to be effective uh, with the with the remote work style. So this is absolutely an opportunity from the real estate perspective to adjust, to be more on the point of what is needed, who really needs to be in the office. And that will be the question, you know, daunting question immediately for the um, executives of many companies, who is essential in person, who can be a great contributor via long distance um, connection to their teams. Uh, again, the, the, the luxury and uh, essence of the in-person interaction, we all miss it and it will come back. Again, science is going to be very helpful in that in time, but immediately we all learn and adapt it really well to the technology. Uh, from the perspective of the investment in the real estate, just rethink what's, what works well, just like Tammy mentioned earlier in, in our conversation learn from it that this is it would be a shame if that big experiment will go to waste without any follow throughs and lessons learned uh, this is a true opportunity to establish new bases for many organizations when it comes to the needs of the physical footprint yeah that's kind of a follow-up to that is is what are your your primary change management objectives well, I think all companies, there's no absolutes, right? We all have very unique cultures and the way we practice work before versus how we might practice work moving forward. There's opportunity for change and adaption. Um, as Ala mentioned, you know, this remote work test has really given us um, a lot of opportunity to make changes to our current workplace strategies. You know, some people might advance further and some people might try things for the first time. A, a question um, for all you guys, and maybe this is more uh, geared toward, toward Christy, um, at least for starters. So are large companies with open floor plans all uh, following a, a standard guideline for, for work? after COVID? A standard one, I don't think so, but uh, you know, I have, uh, well, especially with our German offices, the government has actually put out standards and I think we can expect that too here in the US and probably from our mayor and from our governor. Um, uh, so there may be some uh, rules to follow from, you know, there will probably be an unrolling of some sort of standard that uh, will come out before we all go you know, back into the workspace or move through that. But again, I think, um, you know, to Tammy's point, the, our cultures are different beyond that kind of underlying standard. Every uh, office community is going to have to assess that for themselves because our work environments are very different. Some of them are office, you know, here in LA, some people's work environments are going back to the movie set or uh, some people uh, are going, you know, to um, a factory, you know, it's a very different environment for a lot of people. And so that's going to have to be tailored uh, based on those environments. And I think, you know, this, again, this idea of, um, uh, uh, health and well-being and safety. I mean, it, it, the the leaders of these companies have to really stress, uh, at, you know, having a plan of some sort, not just doing an underlying standard, but really customizing it to their environment, their culture, and their people. Here's a, another question for for all of you, um, and and uh, Elizabeth, this is obviously in your wheelhouse, but but you guys all work with with data to design. How is data um, 
used to design workplaces to meet evolving employee requirements and fluid occupancy levels as we move forward. Yeah, I think just from the data perspective as, as being an aggregator and someone who looks at our data on a daily basis, I think the, the benefit of having utilization data is that it is extremely dynamic. It's changing every day. It's something that you can look at on an hourly basis down to a per minute basis. And so as things are changing, it's important to be really familiar with that data set so that what you can use it to you know, make informed decisions when those decisions come across your desk, um, work from home desk. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, any, anybody else can I weigh in on data yeah. driven design? I, I think now more than ever, the data is going to be so important. And we tried to um, stress upon our clients that it was important before just so they could get, see the benefit of their real estate and how it was being used in all the space types and how it's feeding back into the clients or to the staff. Um, but I think Elizabeth's program has so much more potential now, you know, to show how even different things like this cleaning level application. I mean, there's just so much more that can be looked into to help companies really understand what's happening um, because you, it's impossible to see it by yourselves on a daily basis. You know, you, you need those sensors everywhere to see what's happening at all times. And it will help with the perception uh, and, and of the users and the feelings of discomfort, fear, uh, all of that, it's, it's gonna be present uh, for quite some time. So um, the sensor technology can absolutely help to address it. Yeah, um, I, well, another yeah. comment, um, I was, on a panel with someone yesterday who's the one of the founders of Navigator CRE. And so this is like thinking of real estate as a macro level and it's fascinating what they're pulling together right now. And so they're pulling all of the COVID cases in LA, for example, and where, you know, if you have a global portfolio, which spaces could you open sooner than others based on the geography, the demographics, the, you know, the demographics of the folks who work in that property and so forth. So pulling all of those components together is so important to, you know, really uh, inform decision making. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to know if we've seen any feedback on privacy with sensor technology and uh, privacy, especially in Europe. Um, yeah, I, I can definitely address that. We there are a number of different sensor types. You have camera sensors out there that are using um, vision-based technology. What we use, for example, is all anonymous sensing. So whether you do tie that back to the workstation level, all of the sensor data is completely anonymous. And I know for most of us vendors, you know, we've gone through all of the checks to make sure that we are GDPR compliant coworker, for example, is. Um, we have hosted private instances in Europe so that we can safely and securely be GDPR compliant. So that's kind of the biggest overarching body that governs our, our safety and security and compliance um, in collecting data in Europe. Um, but happy to address more of that in detail if, if someone would like to reach out. Here's another interesting question regarding airflow concerns. Um, it was stated that open space is uh, more desirable at this time, but uh, there's a report uh, apparently out of China stating that a restaurant was found to uh, have spread the, the virus via the AC circulation. So how, how do we uh, address airflow concerns moving forward? Yeah, I was wondering if Christy might have a... <laughs> I think that's, that, that's, that's kind of direct challenge. I think that's that's probably the one that um, uh, you know we can talk about you know moving people six feet apart and and you know taking chairs away, but the airflow systems uh, are are really important and uh, how to um, address those in these in you know the existing infrastructure of our buildings and and cities is going to be of utmost importance. And I and I see a a major focus on that uh, happening as uh, uh, as work starts to um, or at least as people start populating back into their workplace environments. I think there has to be, I, I don't know the solution yet, I'm sure, but I, I know that, that that needs to be taken very seriously. 
Yes, we have been living it for years with the recirc recirculating air light system. So there's absolutely opportunity to open up into uh, modern solutions that exist, right? Yeah, I think interestingly, um, there's a lot of discussion around contact tracing and how we can use existing technology like the ex workplace experience apps to track where people have been in the office that day so that if we do determine that someone is exposed, we can do that contact tracing. Obviously that doesn't solve the ventilation issue, but it does solve, you know, where exposed people have been. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate the dialogue that's out there right now, putting that kind of leaning on the technology vendors to help. But I think too, you know, if we, if we take that in the lens of really upgrading our infrastructure, I think, again, it, it's not going to be in the immediate fix, but I think in the long term, we're really going to have to rethink um, how we handle our existing buildings, um, how we can, um, you know, uh, essentially uh, reuse the infrastructure, but make them much healthier and more sustainable. I think that is going to be, um, you know, a much heavier uh, uh, issue than it has been. It's not a nice to have, it's a must have. How about using UV lighting? Uh, do you see buildings being outfitted with, with UV fixtures that are activated perhaps overnight uh, when the space is unoccupied to help sanitize the space? Apparently that's, a, that's also used in, in clean rooms. Can right. that be used for the office? Some solutions, right, that are already present in the healthcare or lab design facilities. Um, obviously it will be all just the pilot and testing of those for application for the office use. Um, they do have to, they do have some limitations, right? They, some, you know, similar with the finishes throughout the office facilities. Are we going to be seeing the increase of the antimicrobial finishes again from the healthcare and such uh, industries? Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure in the um, facilities that are being designed right now or being renovated, those ideas are coming up front. Uh, you know, in, in particular, specific to UV light application, we'll see because the effectiveness of that is also somewhat limited and to apply it to the broad spectrum of the office, you know, will de definitely present itself as a somewhat limitation. But you know what, back to the opportunity for the rapid innovation, who knows, you know, maybe in months to come, we'll see something radical, new and fantastic that we'll be all cheering about. So, you know, again, innovation, need for innovation is right here, right now. And there are some smart people that are coming up with great ideas. Now there's a big concern um, about the sharing of devices. Uh, so for shared workspaces, how would uh, ergonomic equipment be used when each employee may have access to the same equipment? Well, I think um, mostly, you know, when you go to a free address um, program, a lot of the equipment is independently provided. So everyone has their own and it's your pack. It's what you take around everywhere. Um, the ergonomic equipment such as um, monitors maybe are more stagnant, but I would see those being easily wiped down, you know, moving forward because they're, they're wiped down today. Um, one of the challenges will be the, uh, the new um, touchscreen monitors, right? There's a lot of touchscreen coming into play. So that probably will have to be looked at from an equipment standpoint. But traditionally, um, keyboards are also independent. So those are things that people can keep on their own or they have them built into their laptops. So it's not necessarily an issue. You might see, I, I think we might have brought this up, but you might see in a traditional environment, um, organizations now saying that you might have to have a clean desk policy regardless. So that way their things are picked up on a nightly basis and those individual stations, workstations, offices can be wiped down on a nightly basis because typically that doesn't happen. The operational practices are cut dramatically back um, for uh, stagnant or traditional offices. Do you see um, a new emerging technology for workplace activity tracking resulting from this situation? I know that that technology is, has been employed for, for years in, in more agile offices. Do you see that kind of increasing in offices in general? 
I can answer from a technology perspective. Um, I don't think it will necessarily be new technology. I think what uh, we as technology vendors are being uh, encouraged to do and asked to do from our customers, mutual customers is collaborate more. So if a company like Coworker has Bluetooth beacons already in offices, can that help to find people in space? Um, whereas previously, hasn't been as much of a demand or you know you implement five technologies to accomplish that let's try to do this more efficiently and make sure that this is successful and working together yeah and maybe little you know accessories so there is this ergonomic sheep or something that tells you to get up stand up and stretch maybe there will be another something that tell we will tell you um, when have you washed your hands recently <laughs> you know this is uh, this is probably definitely you are gonna see um, abundance of the visual cues and potentially technology apps that will address making sure that we keep safe when we are now limited with the direct interactions. Yeah. There was a comment from the audience that said that they, they liked um, the, the reference to healthy buildings. And, and as we um, are coming up on the hour here, I'm wondering if, if you can just take a minute um, and, and just kind of expand on your thoughts on, on, on some of the, the, the benefits that are, that are uh, occurring as, as we move forward, um, primarily in relation to creating a, a healthy office environment and, and some of the kind of the people-centric approaches that are being taken uh, in the workplace. I think, I think one of the things that we have to always remind ourselves, uh, like when this whole process happened, uh, we acted as a global community in the benefit to help save lives. And that was massive and immense and, and incredible. And I think if we, if we keep that sentiment as we go back to work and recognize that not only do we have to create healthy environments, but the environments that we're going back into, if we've learned nothing from this, is all dependent on each other. Like, so it's not just my space I come back into in the office, you know, my health and my well-being and your well-being are intrinsically connected. And that, that is even beyond the workspace. I mean, it's going to be in our, our um, commuting systems, that type of thing. We've got to all be as uh, sensitive and conscious about uh, understanding our community and, and our spaces as we come into, um, uh, back into work. And um, I think, you know, as far as a healthy building, first we want, I mean, if, I, if you just talk about the architecture, it's, it's, it's definitely something that is, um, uh, you know, something that responds to our humanistic qualities, which again gets back to fresh air, uh, access to outdoors, light, air. But then we have our, just our community as social beings within our workspace too. And it's important that even though we may have some distancing and we, we're coming back with masks on and it may feel very awkward, uh, that is all in, uh, because we all are working with each other to make sure we're all staying healthy. And, uh, and you know, if we rely on each other in the same way we relied on each other to get out of the workspace, uh, I think, you know, We'll, we'll be, um, you know, and if we're conscious of that, we're going to be in a great uh, position to um, to come back into healthy work environments and supportive work environments. That's great. I think that's a that's a great way to to wrap this up. As as Jim mentioned uh, in his address in the beginning, that that uh, necessity is the the mother of invention, and it is um, an interesting proposition to to. Uh, to look at the opportunity that is going to come out of this and the way that workplace is going to be shaped and actually be better uh, moving forward than it was uh, even a couple months ago before we knew this could even happen. So um, we will uh, actually keep the, the chat uh, function open um, for the next five minutes or so. Uh, if anybody has any additional questions that they'd like to ask the panel, we will be publishing a, a follow-up document to everybody who was, was on this webinar um, with uh, questions to, or answers to, to all the questions that were asked uh, from our panelists and, and the additional ones that come in. Again, I'd like to, to thank you all for, for joining us today. We trust that you will stay healthy and safe. And uh, we'll see you again in a month, um, in about a month, when we, we host our, our next uh, webinar, which will be geared more toward some of the implementation aspects of getting back into the office. Thank you all. Thanks, Rick. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Bye, girls. Bye. 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 <laughs>